Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining us from. Um, we're going to give everyone a few minutes uh, or a minute to sort of join in uh, before we kick off. So uh, don't, uh, don't be alarmed if we're sitting here in silence when you first, uh, when you first join. Right. It seems like the uh, the participant numbers have uh, sort of reached a bit of a plateau at the moment. So I think we'll we'll take that as a good signal to get started. Uh, so good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Graham Ramshaw. I'm Westminster Foundation for Democracy's Director of Research and Evaluation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this event on doing development democratically. This, uh, this online discussion is one of over 40 events, uh, webinars, online sessions being held today as part of the Global Democracy Coalition Forum, uh, a virtual 24 hour event uh, convened on the eve of the Summit for Democracy, which is scheduled uh, for later this week on the 9th and 10th of December. And that includes uh, another WFD uh, hosted event uh, today uh, on why women's political leadership is essential for democracy, which is happening at, at 1 p.m. Uh, UK time, so three hours from now. So please do check that out. Uh, the main messages uh, from our speakers at our event today and all the other webinars that are happening uh, will be communicated to the organizi organizers of the summit to try and feed into that uh, global discussion about democracy. So with that in mind, you'll see that the event is being recorded uh, today to facilitate the collation of those messages. And I just want to uh, add a quick thank you here at the beginning to my uh, colleague Beth, uh, who's co-hosting the event and hopefully is seeing off any technical glitches before they emerge. Uh, after our session today, uh, we would encourage you to visit the Global Democracy Coalition website, which is www.globaldemocracycoalition.org. Uh, and attend some of the other events that are being uh, held today. And I, I see my uh, colleague has put the link there in the, uh, in the chat. So our event today is going to be a conversation. Uh, I think we're all a bit tired of, of sort of webinars and presentations and things. So I wanted this to be a, a sort of a visual podcast, <laughs> if you will. Um, so the panelists and I will go back and forth on a, a number of questions over the course of uh, the first sort of 45, 50 minutes or so. And then um, I'll pull some questions and comments uh, from you, uh, the audience, to discuss with the panel uh, before we close at 11.15. Uh, so please use the, the Q&A function that you should see at the bottom of your screen uh, to register those comments and questions throughout the event. Uh, and also don't forget to use the, the hashtag, um, hashtag Global Democracy Coalition uh, to tweet uh, about this, this webinar uh, during the course of the day. So on to our topic, uh, doing development democratically. Uh, what is it? Is it possible? Uh, is it preferable? Uh, we're two days ahead uh, of a global summit for democracy convened in response to concerns of advancing authoritarianism and illiberalism, uh, a trend enabled by China and Russia, uh, exacerbated by COVID. Um, but this declining trajectory for democracy is not a new story. Um, the excellent varieties of democracy project, VDEM, 
uh, their data suggests that 2006 was actually the inflection point uh, at which the supply of democracy globally began to decline. Uh, and in describing this phenomenon, the academic Larry Diamond uh, made very apt use of a quotation from Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, uh, where a character is asked, how did you go bankrupt? And he replies, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. Uh, and so it is felt, I think, with respect to democracy uh, globally. Nevertheless, having waited uh, this long to respond, uh, we now face the combined challenges of repelling this sort of growing appeal of authoritarianism while also rebuilding our economies in the shadow of a persistent pandemic. Meeting all these challenges at once will necessarily mean tensions and trade-offs, uh, all policy decisions do. But is democracy versus development or democracy versus economic growth inevitably one of those trade-offs? Uh, this debate is also not a new one. Uh, Foreign Affairs devoted an entire issue to the subject uh, back in 2005, uh, when democracy was still in ascendancy. We we're all still sort of in the, uh, the flush of that sort of uh, wave of democratization. Um, and yet it still remains un unresolved. Um, for every proponent of development as freedom, uh, there's one who sees democracy as optional. For every advocate of developmental autocracy, there's one for whom democracy is fundamental for open societies and open economies. Uh, and this is more than just an academic debate. While unresolved, uh, this sort of tension, these trade-offs is becoming increasingly important for policymakers, uh, who in many cases are dispersing smaller amounts of aid uh, following the recessions uh, we faced over the last year or so under greater scrutiny uh, over both effectiveness of that aid and the values uh, of that aid. We're being uh, exhorted to build back democratically, but it's not clear what that really means, uh, whether we as an international community are structurally capable of doing it or what success looks like. So joining me today to discuss all this, uh, maybe come up with some answers, but uh, hopefully at least coming up with some better questions uh, are Susan Dodsworth from the University of Queensland in Australia, uh, Panindra Adhikari from uh, International Idea in Nepal, uh, Tom Wingfield, uh, formerly of uh, DFID, now with APT Associates, uh, and Lisbeth uh, Pilsgaard from the Danish Institute for Parties and Democracy, who are our co-host today for this event. Thank you all for being here. Susan, if I could start with you, uh, you and I wrote an article uh, published in the Journal of Democracy in January, um, where we argued that the trade-off between democracy and development is more purported than real. Uh, in your opinion, why are democracy and development so often seem to be or perceived to be at tension with each other? Thanks, Graham. Um, and I want to say to the audience that, you know, to give a little bit of background about the article Graham and I wrote, it was a, the product of years of frustration, essentially, and sort of trying to get off my chest something I'd noticed ever since I was a PhD student, that among the development community, there really seemed to this, be this very deeply entrenched belief that there's this inescapable trade-off between democracy and development, and that ultimately you know, you've got to sacrifice democracy to achieve developmental goals. Uh, but as Graham's flagged, there are a number of reasons, I think, that, um, you know, this sort of perception has lasted as long as it has. Uh, one of those is that, you know, simply first impressions count. The narrative that, you know, there's this tension, that there's this inescapable trade-off, you know, that was the story that got out there first. Um, and at the time, it appeared to be the story that was supported by empirical evidence. Um, but as we've gotten more um, and better data about both democracy and development, um, a lot of the more recent research has challenged that and shown, um, if not that democracy is necessarily always good for development, certainly that the idea of this inescapable trade-off, you know, is not supported. Um, there's either kind of no relationship there or probably more likely a kind of weak positive one. Um, but that hasn't really shifted the underlying perception. Um, and I've been reflecting on that a bit in advance of this event. And I wonder if perhaps academics are part of the problem. Um, if we're maybe not getting out there and kind of making our research sufficiently accessible um, to kind of allow practitioners to update their thinking um, on this issue. 
Um, so I'm glad to still see events like this taking place where we get a chance to kind of open up some of these questions and um, rethink what's often taken for granted. Thanks, Susan. Now, I mean, just to, over to you, Elizabeth. I mean, earlier this year, uh, Denmark launched a new strategy for development co corporate cooperation. Uh, and one of the tenets, and I'll, I'll quote this to make sure I get it right, <laughs> um, is that the foundation of Denmark's development cooperation is anchored in democratic values and human rights. Now, this was, I think, in June that this got signed off. So it's still quite early, obviously. In, 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 but do you think this is a shift uh, in how the, the Danish um, Ministry for Foreign Affairs is going to is sort of perceiving these potential trade offs between democracy and development, or is it really just a sort of continuation of, of previous policy in terms of working with democracy and development? Thanks, Graham, and uh, good to see uh, all of you uh, here. Um, well, I think there are several aspects in, in, in the question, and uh, maybe there's an issue to be discussed about the trade off because that in itself, when you frame it, like that, it has uh, quite strong connotations. Again, I'm not representing the Danish Foreign Ministry uh, or Development Agency, so I can only give you my take on, on how it's seen. And certainly there is a, with our current government, an interest in a value-based uh, uh, policy on, on development aid. There's also a great interest in uh, having the fundamentals of democracy uh, anchored into uh, the work of development aid. So I'm not, I don't necessarily see it as a huge change, change, but I see it as a positive development that there is a increasing understanding and acceptance that uh, democracy plays an important role in terms of uh, developing uh, uh, the world and uh, providing stability and uh, better conditions for humans all around. I can say much more, but uh, you you interrupt me in your podcast how how you wanted, Graham. <laughs> well, yeah, we can come in and maybe a bit uh, on some of these other ones. I mean, I, I want to turn to uh, Panindra now, actually. And so you've been working at the the nexus of democracy and development in Nepal for a number of years um, with a variety of organizations and funded by lots of different uh, international partners. So, in your experience, how does this um, you know, whether it's a real trade-off or a perceived trade-off uh, between democracy and development, affect the design of aid programs uh, in practice? And, and what impact does it have on, on their effectiveness? Oh, you're still on mute, uh, Penindra. Thank you, Graham. Uh, hello, panelist, and hello, everyone. Um, well, I'll, I have worked in Nepal for a long time, but I have also worked in Rwanda briefly. Both offer a contrast, you know. Um, well, Nepal has been going through the conflict and peace process and then the democratic process. We have a new constitution in 2015, then the federalization process uh, is currently ongoing. We have three spheres of government. Uh, which is the federal, provincial, and local government. Um, and then I was in Rwanda where, you know, genocide uh, took place, unfortunately, 1994, and people were really, really, um, you know, got affected, badly affected, and people, you know, what is, uh, what is uh, important? Is it democracy or is it immediate development that is key? I mean, what I saw... I will give you nuances uh, that uh, some of the politicians from Nepal that landed in Rwanda the first day, and they were super impressed by the physical development. I think when you talk about development, people look at infrastructure as development, and they see it, and they can they can feel it, and they can they can use it. So they they saw such a clean city with the clean system in place, and they thought, okay, this is what is, uh, what about development? Perhaps while in Nepal, we have democracy, but we have not, uh, you know, experienced that kind of development that we are intending to. And then uh, in Nepal corridor and context, my friends and relatives and all talk about what has democracy paid? We have not got any development. Look at, uh, look at, they don't come, uh, compare about China. They, they may compare about Cambodia because I've also been in Cambodia. So they compare about Rwanda or Vietnam. 
So probably the good development is more important when you say. But my experience of living in Rwanda for three years, when I came to know the subtlety uh, of the challenges that there is no democracy, it's autocratically led uh, government. And when you are an investor and then if you make a minor mistake, uh, then uh, you know you are not allowed to continue. Suddenly, your whole investment goes away, and you are frustrated. While if you had a democratic institution, it will follow the rules, rules and system, and then it will not affect the people as such. So that's uh, that's what I see. And I, if I go back to some of the program uh, in Nepal back in 2010, when I was heading the Enabling State program, which is uh, which is uh, about. Uh, promoting democracy through by working with civil society and government, uh, very much around that peace process when the constitution was happening. We could do all work around free press, we could work with the media, we could work with the human rights organization, we could work, uh, we could have a long discussion on inclusion and exclusion, we could have research. I think that democratic, the open environment allowed that. But if you if you go to Rwanda, or if you go to Cambodia, I mean, or a taking example of you know free press, how Hong Kong got so affected, how Cambodia human rights you can't talk about human rights in Cambodia, how you can't talk about exclusion in Rwanda because they are all Rwandans. So it limits it limits the research, it limits the policy aspects, and it's 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 basically development happens, but for what purpose? I think you, it's it's very much around solution centered or you know uh, supply driven development, which may not make a lot of sense. So that's where I will say uh, you know who makes the decision and how the decisions are made is very important, and that democratic environment provides that. And once the right decision happens, then development process can really take a safe, sustainable approach. I think that's what I've been learning recently more while implementing Karen's program. I think we'll come back to that. But, um, uh, but I think uh, democracy and development needs to go hand in hand for a sustainable development. Because I think for me, it's much more perceived. If you see development tangibly, it's infrastructure, but has it affected the growth in humans? Have we have uh, had human development in a way which in a, in a non, non democratic environment, non democratic environment is less likely. So I think we're looking at human development from that perspective, not just the infrastructure or the physical development. So that's what I see. I think it needs to go together. If it is separated, I think it's much more perceived. Uh, and then if the democracy doesn't deliver, then people will be frustrated. I think that's probably a frustration in Nepal that's going on at the moment. Um, I think I'm, I've talked a lot, so I might uh, stop and then I, you can ask me more questions later on. Thanks, Venindra. Yeah, Susan, uh, Rwanda is one of the countries that um, sort of features in, in your, some of your research around, around this sort of perceived trade-off. Yeah, I was really struck by the fact that um, Venindra brought this up as an example because it is one of those cases that's been um, a big part of the reason why this idea that democracy and development are intention has proved so hard to change, because you do have this small number of cases like Rwanda, where authoritarian regimes appear to have been incredibly successful um, in their developmental programs. I mean, I had a similar, you know, uh, experience to what Beninda described. I, I was traveling in Uganda and I went across the border into Rwanda and you know, immediately you can see that the you know the country has just achieved far more in terms of development. Um, but there are a couple of reasons why we have to be really cautious about that example. Um, one is that it's a little bit um, data from authoritarian regimes like Rwanda is been quite a few controversies around some of the data on poverty reduction that have come out. Um, of Rwanda. Uh, but perhaps more importantly is the fact that, you know, these authoritarian success stories, you know, as visible as they are, you know, are probably it's highly unlikely that they're replicable. replicable. Like not everyone can be Rwanda. Um, because as Fernanda has pointed out, you know, the development that occurred there occurred in, you know, pretty unique circumstances following this massive crisis that really put Rwanda at the top of the international community's agenda. 
Um, and the reality is that most other developing countries aren't going to be in that situation. And so relying on those kinds of authoritarian success stories, I think is quite, quite misleading and really quite dangerous. Um, if we let that sort of guide our decisions about whether or not that trade-off between, you know, democracy and development, you know, really exists and is actually worth it. Thanks, Susan. I want to bring uh, Tom in now. So, Tom, you spent um, a, a long time with, with DFID, now, now FCDO, uh, as a governance advisor in a variety of countries, in, including Nepal. Um, what were some of the sort of internal debates uh, around how issues of sort of democratic governance were programmed uh, within DFID when you were there? And, and, and does, does the calculus around any potential trade-off feel different with sort of democracy in decline versus sort of maybe a period before where, where democracy felt maybe inevitable or certainly sort of much more likely than it does uh, at the moment? Thanks, Graham. I mean, I think probably want to dodge the question about internal debates, but I think overall, if we look at the kind of engagement of, of donor agencies and external actors in this space, I think the real challenge is that there isn't enough of a debate. Um, and, and these big issues, these big kind of philosophical questions about the role of aid and how development actually takes place in countries, that debate is really supplemented. And so just about every development agency will have a policy commitment to supporting more open politics and human rights and democratic change. But the reality, and this is the critical, critical point, the reality is that if you look at the way programs are designed and the conventional orthodox development approach, if you look at the cumulative impact in a country, it's profoundly anti-democratic. And so, and I think some of this has been discussed, you know, quite a lot, but, you know, the, the general working assumption of conventional aid is that development is a technical administrative process, which ignores the fact that actually development is about politics and power, and these are deeply political processes. And the way conventional aid is designed is it sees politics and the political process as a problem. It basically doesn't trust that process. And most designs, if you look at the detail, are designed in a way to work around the political process and to put in place mechanisms to insulate the development programming from political influence. And that's really deeply problematic because I think cumulatively, you know, if you look at the, the sheer number of projects operating in a country or within a within a jurisdiction, it does unintentionally influence the rules of the game and it does privilege certain types of institutions. And so I think in kind of authoritarian contexts, this technocratic administrative approach can actually unintentionally underwrite and provide legitimacy to quite illegitimate regimes, but also much more, I think, importantly, in, in more open political systems, the way projects are designed where funding is earmarked, which removes the discretion provided to locally elected leaders, or projects are designed with parallel kind of implementation units to implement particular project activities, that actually can unintentionally undermine more open and more democratic politics in, in these contexts. So I think there are some really fundamental challenges with the kind of rhetoric and the policy ambitions and then how programs are actually designed. I think there are ways around this and there are ways to kind of solve this or begin to solve this wicked problem, but we have to start with, with really opening up that debate. Thanks, Tom. Um, Elizabeth, so one of the reasons why we, we convened this, this panel was that um, we at WFD have been arguing something sort of essentially similar to what, what Tom has outlined there, that. Uh, that actually we should be pursuing what we're calling sort of doing development democratically approach where programs are designed and delivered in ways that sort of facilitate good democratic practice. Um, for instance, engaging more with, with uh, sort of political institutions like parliaments, political parties, uh, and not just with sort of executive agencies, ministries, uh, et cetera. Um, and this idea that you can sort of model how democratic practice can yield positive outcomes. 
with what's what's DIPD's experience uh, recently in terms of of how um, development agencies that you interact with are sort of looking to integrate democracy uh, more robustly with sectoral programming like uh, sort of economic development or sort of security sector reform, etc. Um, are, are you seeing any sort of trend in that direction or, or is democracy still sort of sort of carved out as a as a separate silo uh, of work that's done independently of this other development work that uh, that Tom described? That's a quite complex question, Graham. Thanks. <laughs> I, I want to go a little bit back to what Tom uh, started off, which I think is is very, very important. And thanks for framing uh, the, the problem uh, so clearly. Um, it reminds me very much, I mean, I have a past in, in the humanitarian sector and we have in that sector been endlessly discussing the humanitarian development nexus and now humanitarian development security nexus. There is something about the whole way of, uh, and it, 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 it just rings a lot of pills of what, what Tom was saying about this thing of how we organize our work and how development aid is, is structured and, and siloed. Um, and we seem to be, yeah, moving around some of the same challenges um, aid is, is political, as, as you said, Tom, but it's also structurally how you organize it. And, and I agree the programming, uh, which is done by many of the Northern, from the Northern hemisphere is not particularly uh, creative or, or, or have, challenged, have challenged itself in the way that they are doing it. Um, and, and I think we, uh, we have been having these discussions, perhaps in may, more closed forums about that we need to do things differently. Um, and, and now we put in, uh, I mean, doing democ uh, development differently is something that is a focus of the Danish uh, development aid and, uh, and, and, and probably many others. Um, wouldn't it be interesting if we kind of integrated uh, <laughs> Uh, and not having democracy as something totally external or different or in a, in, a, in a contradiction. I don't see, in principle, the contradiction. I see structural and programmatic that we need to, to work differently. But if the end result is that we are trying to support and induce and develop democratic societies, all pillars and fundaments of supporting that is needed. Um, and they're not necessarily contradicting itself, but the way that we've structured that the finance, the fundraising, the finance, financing of it is certainly a, a challenge. We, we did try, Graham and I, I, when we talked about this event that we, we really tried to get the Swedes to join us because they, I think they are trying, uh, Sweden is trying with the drive for democracy to integrate a democratic approach in all their aspects of, of their work and decisions and policies as well. And I think as in many other examples, we should look to Sweden and see how they're doing. I think it's still a challenging work for them, but at least politically, if they made a decision that they want to try and integrate uh, the approach of democracy into all aspects uh, of work. So I'm not sure I answered your question, Graham, <laughs> but, uh, but perhaps I made it uh, just to say that it is, I think it is uh, complex, but it's, it, it, it shouldn't be. And, and we probably in, in the sector of doing democracy support should also be careful of not uh, closing ourselves into a little ghetto of uh, do-gooders of uh, that we are the only one who can do democracy support. I mean that that is certainly also something we we need to work on, and we should be better in reaching out and working with all the different um, agencies, institutions, political parties, and so on in in the different countries. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, Susan, your your research has yielded some some interesting examples where democratic practice and development outcomes um, overlap. What were some lessons we could draw from that with respect to sort of doing development democratically? Yeah, I think there are a couple of um, useful lessons, probably two in particular that that stand out. I think probably the most important is that often when you do find these synergies between democracy and development. Um, they're real, they're easy to miss because they're kind of less sexy, less exciting bits of democracy, right? Like it's, it's 
generally not elections that we see driving this kind of thing, which is, you know, where a lot of the attention tends to be. Um, you know, it's things like, you know, parliamentary committees or post-legislative scrutiny that is done by legislatures. Um, you know, there's a, a relatively small group of people who are really into that kind of thing. Uh, but that's actually where we tend to see some, you know, really useful success stories um, coming out, uh, including, for example, you know, um, to give one example, the in, in Malawi, where I did some research with WFD, um, we found that the parliamentary committees played a really important role in helping to kind of transform the HIV and AIDS management bill um, that had been initially put forward in a fairly kind of regressive way um, and a way that was sort of seen as being potentially quite counterproductive in terms of the country's fight against HIV and AIDS. Um, but thanks to international donors, uh, and in that case, UNAIDS, um, really making an effort to work with the parliament and engage with the parliamentary committees, um, it ultimately produced a bill or an act at the end that was far more respectful of the rights of people with HIV um, and also a, a, a piece of legislation that did a lot more to engage um, with women and to look at the kind of gendered aspects of HIV and AIDS in, Mal and AIDS in Malawi. Um, but if you're looking at kind of, you know, for mass you know, elections or democratic revolutions and, and sort of how those contribute to development, you miss those kinds of positive success stories that are happening in a much kind of nuanced um, and fine-grained way. Um, the second important lesson I would say is that what we also really need to do is to think critically about the kind of development that we're aiming to promote, right? Like, it's not obvious what development is or what it should be. And, you know, this actually links back a little bit to what um, Fenindra said in his opening comment, which was, you know, it's also about sustainable development. And I should all, I would argue as well about, you know, do we want de development that is inclusive or exclusive, right? Because it's when we start to think more critically about the kind of development that we're trying to foster, that we really start to see the value of democratic institutions. That's great, Susan. And I think that that's a really good segue into, um, into asking Tom, um, you know, you mentioned that there's sort of some structural uh, sort of challenges to, to doing development uh, democratically. So, so if the international community were to commit to sort of building back democratically, doing development democratically, what, what do you think would have to change about the way um, that we currently support uh, both development and democracy? So starters for 10, um, I mean, I think overall, it, it does require quite a radical rethink. It's not something that you can kind of tweak around the edges. It, it really requires going back to fundamental first principles around those kind of three core governance questions around who decide in, and about following the money. And it, the three questions are around who decides about the allocation of resources. Is it a donor? Is it a bureaucrat? Or is it actually the elected officials who have the legitimacy and the mandate to make those decisions? How are those decisions made? Are they made in donor capitals? Or are they made by bureaucrats? Or are they made through an open decision-making process? And the third question is, in, in whose interests are those decisions made around the allocation of resources? Is it Does it go to politically connected firms? Um, does it privilege particular representatives of certain communities? Or are decisions made in the, in the public interest. So that's kind of, if you if you focus on those three questions and if you interrogate each of your programs around those three questions, I think it helps you understand the nature of the problem and, and what incentives your programs are actually setting in the way that they're designed. In terms of stepping back, in terms of some of the kind of the three areas that we, we might want to think about focusing on. I mean, one is I think there's a real risk when we talk about democracy and doing development democratically, that we shift into a very normative Western liberal agenda. And there's a, you know, there's a big critique around democracy evangelism. And I think we need to avoid that, that knee jerk response. I think we need to really think carefully about avoiding perfect institutions. And we need to recognize that we can't transplant a democratic model. I mean, countries transition into being more democratic because people demand it and because of changing power relations. And as external actors, we're gonna be marginal in that process. 
Um, and we've seen, you know, there is a vast graveyard of failed governance projects, um, which have had assumptions around optimism bias and hubris and all, all kinds of real issues there. So the starting point is we really need to deeply, deeply understand the context, um, where the opportunities for a positive change lie, and then tuck in behind those endogenously led, locally led processes, which will lead to more open politics. Um, I mean, I think the second element is, you know, we need to avoid a projectized approach to doing development democratically. So typically, you know, a democratic or political governance program, it's usually one project um, which sits in the margins of the whole portfolio. And that, again, there's a risk that if we go down this road, that that just means, oh, we'll just add a, a democratic project alongside of our wider portfolio. So we need to think much more holistically around how we bring diplomacy and development and how the entire portfolio and the way programs are designed are done so in a way which privileges an open political decision-making process. Um, and that really requires working directly with and building relationships with politicians, which again, which is something that development has traditionally been very hesitant about. We, we have really deep alliances with unelected bureaucrats, and we're, we're quite resistant to actually engage with politicians. So that's, that's a really critical element. Um, and we need to, to have huge patience and have a very, very long term approach because these kinds of changes will be incremental and will take place over, you know, decades. And external actors need to be very, very patient and they need to really understand the context and be able to weather very difficult periods, but also be able to respond very opportunistically when opportunities arise. And then the last um, element is that we need to be very humble um, and recognize that aid can never really deliver democracy. Um, and at best, we need to really understand where endogenous led change will come from, which we can then tuck in behind. Um, and finally, there's a real value in developing long-term relationships and partnerships based on trust. And that gives us kind of a certain degree of legitimacy um, in helping facilitate some of these processes. So those are some like quite broad high level areas that you wanna start with, but I think we could get into much more detailed programmatic ideas if, if we have time, thanks. Yeah, I definitely wanna to, want to get some both Elizabeth and Susan's sort of reaction to the to those in terms of you know how how realistic we can we, those some of them are which ones would would most likely happen. But I think before I do that, I just want to get to um, Panindra because you have some recent experience of sort of implementing a program that's that's sort of modeling some of these principles that uh, that Tom's outlined uh, here. Um, what has been the response in, in, in sort of local communities when you've worked um, in, in this way that's sort of approaching these issues differently? Yeah, uh, thank you, Graham. Let me build on to what Tom is saying and provide those nuances. I think uh, what we've been doing, I think we were talking about democracy and then you know, normally in a context like Nepal, when you talk about democracy, it's one election and then you wait for five, five years uh, and that's democracy. It's not about democracy and behavior change within the political parties. So we have changed the structure, but we haven't changed the behavior. And I think the, from the past, not only UK aid programming, but, but also other development programming, what we have learned is, you know, the resource allocation decisions if made by bureaucrats or if made by single politicians, the normally tend to be captured by elites. So taking the, and then it excludes the society, it, 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 it gives bias, the development bias goes to the elites and your, your beneficiary, your targets uh, that are the whole society do not benefit. In, in fact, you are harming that approach. So that was one of the findings uh, of, of 2015 study that we had done. Based on that, and based on the change in context on Nepal, uh, you know, the federal, provincial, and local government structure, uh, we, we embarked on how we can change that 
power relation, how we can change that resource allocation decision, how we can help the decision to be uh, made by the politicians, the elected representative, because in Nepal, particularly the local government are more inclusive. There are representatives uh, in the executive committee, but they don't, there, is, there are one, they don't have the capacity. The second, what the elite, political elite, elite says is they don't have the capability uh, from their own selfish perspective, which is more around, uh, you know, perceived capacity weaknesses. So they don't engage. They say, no, you don't have to worry about it. You are elected. You can sit there. We'll make all the decisions. So that's how the resource continues to be captured. So what we have done is we have set out uh, uh, a process called uh, deliberation in political decision making. Uh, deliberation means it has to be formal. So the, the more formal you make it, you avoid the informal rules of the game. So you push it towards formal decision making process. You push it towards evidence based uh, uh, decision making. You have data and you have to help visualize those data so the decisions are not just emotional. You, you, are, you need to make sure it's inclusive as well as participatory. And, uh, and then if you help build the capability of those particularly marginalized group, uh, then uh, a kind of semblance of the whole process of decision making comes where the decision will be made for the collective public goods. And then comes the bureaucracy implementing it and, 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 and politicians having to make sure the bureaucrats are administratively held accountable. So that's what we've been practicing. And then our approach is uh, doing development differently. Actually, we don't call it doing development democratically. I think it comes from, a, or we don't call it, I mean, we call it thinking and working politically in an internal way. But when you bring in the word politically, then it makes it very sensitive. The bureaucrats uh, do not want to engage because it's much more politics. So, but you also need to balance that engagement. So from that perspective, I think we have had experience of working in 15 local government and we have had, uh, and the approach is that you don't field, uh, we don't field experienced people who have the baggage from the past. We train young graduates as mentors or helping hand uh, into the constitution and all these processes. So that when they go, they become helping hand. They don't replace the capacity, and they really promote deliberative decision making processes from from different angles. So actually, so we're not looking at particular tangible result. We invest in process, a good governance process that leads to a better decision and better delivery of development. So that's what that's what we do. And built on uh, some of the Tom's uh, principles, I think we've been working with UK Aid, um, uh, FCDO now on, 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 on uh, some of the principles of how you work with. It's much more around doing no harm. Development partners should not be doing harm, means they should not go back to the old ways of working. They need to understand the context and priorities and how those priorities have been made. And then they need to have strategic political engagement uh, at the highest level, the ambassador level needs to work with the minister and then you know engage and 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 ensure uh, that it's it's a joint it's 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 a programming based on that priority needs. So that's uh, that's the kind of uh, approach that we are advising, and we're also advising development partners to really engage from need identification process um, with the politicians. Uh, to programming, design, and conceptualization. Because when you are engaged with politicians, then they know better what is actually required, or they can engage with, with their community better. So I think that's, that's the kind of practice. And the, the, the lesson uh, so far, we have had been very positive. And government and the development partners are asking, uh, can you give us share lessons so that we can also consider it. And we are engaging with uh, many development partners based on this learning. And we might have more formal capture of learning and sharing how changes have been possible at a small scale to demonstrate probably around the middle of next year. So we'll have more solid uh, examples coming forth. Thank you. Thanks, Manindra. Um, 
Elizabeth, I think uh, DIPD has been um, active in Nepal uh, in the past. I don't know if you're still there at the moment, but yeah, what, what, do you have any reflections on um, on what Penindra has shared there? Yeah, it, uh, it's uh, it's probably a fascinating example to, to use Nepal. Uh, and it reminded me of we've been there for more than 10 years and uh, in a very, uh, I mean, during very delicate and difficult times, uh, Due to the, uh, the the developments in the country and the political developments, and I think you could say that the way that we have engaged in Nepal has been uh, combining democracy and development um, aspects in a way where we uh, we had we spent a lot of time in consultations with the political leaders on what they saw as their need and interest. And all through, which uh, I'm sure um, our Nepalese colleague can, can comment and confirm, it's, it is sensitive and it's been sensitive at all with international engagement in Nepal. So we had to, as Tom also said, be very, very humble and, and basically ask, you know, what, what are your needs? So what came out of all these 10 years of, of discussion and dialogue and some financial support was a multi-party platform, which I think in the political context of Nepal is quite an achievement where now the political leaders make their decisions and have a, for, a forum where they can discuss and where they now are starting to say and to respond to some of the development, challenging development issues of Nepal. And there are many, but they are now uh, having a, a common interest in aspects of climate change and what they should do to tackle this. So, you could say in that way we've we've actually used uh, the access to the political leaders in 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 terms of then reaching out and and also having them uh, seeing the uh, the combination between politics and development issues but very much that they are at the center and those the, the political leaders of nepal are are those that make the decision Thanks, Elizabeth. And, and Susan, I mean, I don't know if you had any any thoughts on on the sort of the the three sort of broad areas that Tom laid out uh, there in terms of ways in which we can start to make the shift uh, towards doing development in, in a different way that is more democratic and a focus. Yeah, I mean, I found myself really agreeing with a lot of what Tom said. I think he's really kind of picked out, you know, three of the things that you know. I really want needs to begin changing to facilitate this this kind of thing. Um, but I think the tricky thing is that, you know, some of these things we've known about for a while and they've proved remarkably hard to shift. Like, for example, the, the sort of point about taking uh, longer term uh, approaches to some of this work. I mean, this is a, a recurring theme in, in, in much of the work that's been done on, you know, development assistance and its effectiveness has really highlighted that, you know, longer term programs work better. We know this. We've got all sorts of evidence to back it up. Um, practitioners know it. They would often really love to be, you know, taking a, a longer term approach, uh, but they have these sort of constraints, you know, built into the environments where they work, you know, funding cycles, budget cycles. They make it really hard to do this. Um, so I think perhaps we also need to think about not just what, um, you know, the, the practitioner community needs to be doing, but also to be thinking about, look, how do we convince the people higher up about the value of doing this? Like, what's the narrative that we need to be getting out there, you know, to make these more fundamental changes uh, acceptable to people? Um, because another one of the points, for example, that Tom raised is this question around, you know, who controls the money? you know, really, you know, and, you know, it raises this question of, well, you know, are international donors willing to give up control of um, development funds if that's what it takes to, you know, facilitate more democratic development? Um, and for many donors, that's a really hard ask, right? They feel a genuine kind of need and obligation to account for how aid money is spent. Um, and so we still need to find, I think, ways of kind of squaring that circle um, of saying, look, it's possible to, you know, still account for this, to still maintain lines of accountability to our, you know, domestic taxpayers, while still, you know, passing some control and responsibility of this for this over to development partners on the ground, who are better placed to actually kind of 
work out what's needed and what they want. Um, but I think we still need to think about, well, how do we do that? How do we tell that story? How do we make it persuasive? Um, because these things, these sort of established ways of working um, are really hard to shift. Yeah, I think that's right, Susan. I, I mean, so we, at WFD, we worked with um, with Heather Marquette from University of Birmingham on a, on a really uh, interesting piece called Doing Anti-Corruption Democratically, so trying to sort of get into this sort of sectoral approach. And she has a, a great um, quote in here where she says, it's, uh, it's the tensions and trade-offs between the ideal world of best practice governance toolkits and the messy, conflicting world we live in that those of us working in this space seem to struggle with the most. And so I, I just wonder, maybe I'll, I'll sort of go back to Tom a bit about, um, you know, how how do we get people to move past the the obvious attraction of a of a sort of best practice toolkit, which feels easy, it's easy to scale, it's easy to roll up, maybe easy to measure, um, to something that's a little bit more complicated. I mean, I think I mean I think what's really you know important to start with is is understanding the problem and asking questions and looking at the world in a slightly different way. Um, and that's where the, the role of research is really, really critical. It's also where if you can get, you know, if you can bring together a few like-minded development partners who, who are willing to open up and really interrogate their programs through a democratic or open, more open political process way to kind of explore the, the nature of the problem i think that's the most important starting point because if you can if you can identify the problem then you can begin to address it i think um susan's point about the importance of a narrative is absolutely critical and the problem with development is the narrative is very it's very one-sided it's very instrumental it sees development as a way you know as charity as handouts as a way of basically address, addressing the symptoms of the underlying causes of the problem. Um, and I think that's, again, that's where we need to think cleverly and be quite political in how do we open up that debate um, where we recognize that development is deeply political and it's driven through um, changes in the way that power is configured within a society. Um, and these are quite deep historical changes where an external actor can't really play an instrumental role, but can very effectively understand those trends and tuck in behind where, where we think positive change will come from. Um, I think the other element is, you know, building positive examples of radically different approaches where, you know, you could, you could get a series of like-minded development partners looking at one particular context and trying a, a radically different approach and seeing whether that leads to greater impact and how it addresses some of the challenges that Susan and Elizabeth have, have raised around um, issues around accountability for funding um, and accountability for development results. Because I think, I think if, you, if you have the space and the agency to design your approach in a different way, I think a lot of the common concerns around supporting the political process and sovereign process and localization, I think a lot of the, the problems can be actually addressed quite effectively. The challenge is, is that we haven't been doing this in a kind of holistic portfolio wide way or with all of the key donors around the same table. We tend to do it quite incrementally through very small projects and we, which, which means we end up kind of nipping at the heels of the problem and not being able to demonstrate a really significantly different way of working. So those are, those are a few ideas to put on the table. That's great, thank you very much. Right, there's a, a question actually that's come in um, on the chat, which we can sort of use to sort of continue to explore this. And it's, um, it's someone saying, so they say, the shift proposed by today's panel on um, sort of moving development practice and engagement to doing it more democratically, or at least more politically is a sensible one. Uh, but they wondered if we could have a reflection on how to do this in contexts which are usually hybrid regimes uh, without entrenching undemocratic political practices. So, I mean, this is one uh, question we've had in the democracy field for a while is that we've spent a lot of time trying to define 
uh, countries uh, as being de democracy or, or, or not democracy, when, when ultimately most are somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, how would you uh, think about this in, in terms of doing this work um, in, in countries where they're neither a democracy, necessarily a full democracy nor a, a full autocracy? Um, Penindra, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> I, I was thinking, <laughs> um, Nepal is, I think uh, we, um, in our um, report, Global Democracy Report, I think we put in the, it's in the medium. It's uh, it's not transition because we have a new new constitution and new federal structure is taking, in, taking shape after election. So I wouldn't call it transition, but in terms of democratic, practices, I think it's still transition. I think it's a long, long way to go. And uh, again, the whole political process that takes on. Um, we are due for election in 2022, and we're hoping uh, that there will be some change. And we're also looking at uh, a number of changes within, uh, because within the political parties, with the convention, that's currently ongoing in, uh, in one of the democratic party and the other two party have come, come out of the convention. So things are happening, uh, things are quite positive, but how do you, how do I think it's a, it's a frustration for Nepali mass that democracy has not delivered. It's also frustration um, that, you know, one need to have that patience and people need immediate result and within uh, democratic processes it's it's very slow process i think and then it, it's really a slow process i mean if i go back to india i think india didn't have real development until after 40 years of uh, their independence i think it started opening up in 1990 and they had independence in the uh, late 40s 47 so i think um, it's a long process but it's I think it, you can see it begins to deliver results, I think, in a much more sustained way. And it can also, uh, it's a messy process. I think you can see in, in one place, you can see lots of corruption. In another place, you can see uh, politicians not knowing the real, uh, uh, real process, the rules and regulation. And they don't work on law and policies they rush in to spend money to deliver something for either for popular popularism sake or other things. So it's a, it's a very messy process and it takes time. But I think within the Nepali context, I am uh, I'm more optimistic uh, when I see Rwanda, when I see Cambodia, although you don't see that superficial development, but it's, it's a democratic process is taking shape uh, in a slowly. So, and then uh, picking up on Tom's uh, point also that I think we, we need to have that patience, but we need to invest. Uh, development partners particularly have to engage politically and invest in the right kind of process uh, as to how the decisions are made. Uh, and we actually uh, uh, advocate opting in approach for the local government to participate because we don't want to let, because un, under the federal context, I think they are autonomous. They can make their own decision. They can make their law, but we want to help them facilitate. So it's it's a messy process, but it's it's positive. I think people also need to see uh, what uh, you know what comes out in other countries in terms of the human rights aspect, in terms of exclusion, in terms of all those opportunities, and in terms of what opportunities Nepal had and how it can build on. Uh, on to that. Um, so we really need to drive that. I think what um, some of the politicians were really saying is, how can we balance those democratic process with economic development? How can we drive actually the local economic development? Because the sustaining democratic process has to be started at, at that local level. And if we can really work with the local level, the local economic development aspects and bringing in you know, decision making integrated into that process. I think that will uh, take us away. But I think I can understand it. It's quite frustrating. It's frustrating for myself, my friends, relatives. But I'm always telling. I think we need to have patience. We need to invest. That's what we also call. Uh, we have a difference between trans transaction and transformation. I think 
what happens is development partners, because with good intention, I think they do lots of small transactional projects, which doesn't sustain after it ends. So rather you, you start small, but you look at the transformation trajectory, uh, and then, uh, then that, will, that will be much better at a smaller scale and gradually growing, rather than bringing in a project that's quickly you know, finished, does something, but then disappears after a while doesn't help. But having said that, in the disaster area, uh, I think you, you, you need that. It's important. So sorry, I mean, I, I went a little bigger, but I think we need to have patience with our democratic process. I think it takes long. That was the reason I was giving example from India. But if you take example from China, I think it's, it's, it's fast, but I think there are a lot of questions there. So I'll stop it here. <laughs> Thanks, Penindra. And then, uh, Elizabeth, I know you have to uh, drop off soon. So I just wanted to give you a, a sort of a last uh, chance to respond there. I mean, so Tom mentioned there about um, development actors getting much more comfortable working with politicians uh, as part of this sort of answering some of these questions uh, around who controls, who makes decisions, in whose interests. Um, any sort of final reflections from, from DIPD's side in terms of the, the role of political parties and sort of politicians in, in sort of bridging this uh, this divide between democracy and development? Uh, yes, I think uh, we, we have seen and we are trying, at least the way we, we try to operate in, in, in reinforcing and supporting development of political parties, that they are and can be instrumental in pushing development forward in their countries. But that's also a long, complicated road. Uh, maybe, Graham, to your previous comment on hybrids uh, and, and the definitions and all that. I mean, it's also fascinating because I was just reflecting on, well, I think many countries are in hybrid, also the so-called developed countries. So <laughs> uh, across, uh, across the world, we are seeing a democratic challenge uh, also in the so-called uh, developed and uh, more wealthy countries. So democracy and, and political engagement as such is challenged. Uh, so I think there is a need for a revival of the whole way of how we engage in our societies and how people feel included. And the political parties are instrumental, but they're also in a huge challenge because people are opting out and uh, have difficulties in, in, in keeping faith in traditional uh, political parties. So they need also to reform themselves and to reach out and so on. And then my fi final comment, because I think I mean, we're doing this as part of a um, uh, build up to, uh, to Biden's summit and let's hope, I and mean, we put in recommendations from different networks uh, in the European partnership and others, in that we need to look at democracy support in new ways. We need to challenge ourselves and we need to challenge uh, countries and, and donors in the way we do democracy. And uh, I think the, um, the, the article that came out recently by Richard Youngs and Calypso Nicolaitis, Nicolaitis on reversing the democratic gaze that we from, from the so-called um, European perspective need to look at what we can learn from other, other parts of the world so that, it, that basically we need to uh, globalize um, the whole aspect of, of looking at democracy. And as Tom said, there's not one definition. We need to be humble and we, we need to accept and, and develop in, in, as it as it is suited for, for different countries and contexts. So I think I'll end there, but it's been great being with you. And, uh, and uh, I hope that our listeners have also, I presume, a combination of practitioners and, and academics and others that uh, we can continue this discussion also after, after the summit. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Um, and then just to sort of pick up on another so a couple of audience questions. So Elizabeth there touched on challenges. And so you had a couple of questions now, um, one looking more at internal challenges and then one more at external challenges. So, so one was specifically addressed to, to Tom. Um, and so this one was, uh, so you mentioned that the undermining of democracy by how development programs are delivered is unintentional. Um, is it really? Uh, how committed are development partners to supporting democracy over other um, trade, foreign policy priorities? Thanks, Graham. It's quite a loaded question. Um, I mean, I think 
I think there's two issues, right? I think, as I said, kind of at the beginning, I mean, the policy of most, I can't think of anybody who actually has a policy which is says deliberately that they're anti-democratic or they don't support democracy. I think all external actors, donor partners will say quite forthrightly that their policies to support more open and democratic societies. But the critical question is, kind of going back to Susan's point, if you actually look at the challenge, the way incentives are structured, the way donor projects are designed, they're actually, I think they're, they are focused in ways that undermine those principles. I don't think it's a deliberate strategy to um, say one thing and do another. I think, I think it is genuinely unintentional because the incentive systems are very mixed and there's a huge incentive to deliver results and so much of development is kind of caught in that new public management mantra around results-based management and there's a huge onus on development agencies because they're accountable to taxpayers to to show how each pound or dollar or kroner is actually delivering tangible benefits to ordinary people in the countries where we, where we work so I think it is unintentional, um, and but I but that doesn't but that doesn't mean it's not a problem, and that it, it actually cumulatively is not a really serious issue that needs to be to be unpacked and to be resolved. And I think going back, I mean, again, just thinking, listening to Fenindra talking, and going back to Susan's point about we've known these issues have been around for a very long time. How do we actually? influence change in the kind of juggernaut that is international development. I mean, one, one suggestion, an idea, which we, we could put forward as a recommendation is, you know, can we commission some independent research which looks into a series of case studies where development partners or particular programs have been designed in a way which directly tries to reconcile this wicked problem, which tries to work with political decision making and work in ways that privileges the domestic domestic sovereign political process as well as delivering positive outcomes for for people and i think nepal is a fantastic example i mean fenindra's talked us through quite a lot of quite innovative exciting work that international idea is actually um designing and implementing at the moment i know that fcdo in nepal has tried to realign its portfolio so that it, it actually matches the new, quite radical form of federalism that Nepal has introduced. I think also the Swiss um, STC has taken really um, strong steps to align with the federal system and to think about how each program is designed in a way that privileges the political decision-making process, be it at the provincial or the local or the federal sphere. So I think you know one way of shifting incentives is to provide positive examples um, and open up and explore where this has actually been tried in practice and what have we actually learned, what's worked, what hasn't and why. So Nepal I think is a great example, but there may be people in the audience, um, there may be examples elsewhere which we could collectively bring together and really open it up. Because I think one of the, one of the hardest parts of influencing change is when people can't see a way out, where they can only see the problems and they can't find or see solutions. And this may be one way of saying, actually, you can do you can do things in a different way, which has positive outcomes. It's going to be tricky, it's going to be difficult, but it is possible. Um, that, that might help. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And then, as I say, on the on the external challenges, the uh, question which um, I think is probably best first directed at uh, at Penindra, but then uh, obviously open for others to join, is is about the sort of you know what threat do do China and Russia play to doing development democratically, and you know do they play a role in in um, in sort of disturbing any 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 attempt to move in this direction? Um. I think it's difficult. I mean, there is, uh, you know, it's it could be subtle, uh, but there is no overt, uh, you know, evidence of that. So that's uh, it's it's a difficult to answer question. But I think uh, how I see is, I mean, Nepal is between China and India, 
And I think we need to navigate both uh, very tactfully and our politicians and diplomats have to deal with that. Uh, but it's it's uh, and Nepal is in a very, in a hard uh, hard place uh, to deal with that, and we need smart politicians and bureaucrats. And and uh, I think we're trying uh, our best, but I don't know how much. It's my experience. I think that Tom's example of FCDO, the Swiss, and probably uh, organizations like I mean the Norway and others are listening in and uh, it takes time. I think it's, uh, it's, it's un unintentional, but the bias is towards doing the easy thing and what you have been doing and change is difficult. So for change and, 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 and to shift in a very subtle way, it takes time. You need to deal not only with federal, you will need to deal with provincial government, you need to deal with local government and that takes a lot of energy and efforts. I think it's it's about shifting that mindset and prioritizing, but getting uh, slowly uh, in in rightly there. So thinking, I mean, I think I saw another question on transaction and transformation. I think I, I can also build on to that is thinking transformational uh, will be slow process, but it will get there. Thinking transactional will be fast, but it may not give the result. Of course, I think some transaction that helps to build towards transformational um, you know, processes later on, that helps. Some transaction like the COVID response for the disaster response, um, immediate building, rebuilding of schools and all that, that are important. But some of the others, let the democratic uh, course take place. Let the democratic decision take place. I give you one example. Politicians were building roads. And when we went to uh, one of the community, the, the, the females there said, we don't need road actually, we need water. We don't have, we have to walk one hour, two hours for water supply. What's the use of that road when we don't have water? So if properly decisions are made, the political consultations happen with the citizens, then the priorities starts to shift and people starts to get the benefit that they deserve. I think that's what we need to balance that democracy and development into thinking about, uh, you know, the locals. I think we talk about, uh, you know, sustainable, localizing sustainable development, but I talk about, you know, bringing in the priorities of the local and informing that sustainable development, maybe that way is better rather than imposing that sustainable development at that level. I think it needs to grow from the local. That's what I said. So I, I combined a number of questions into one, but I uh, hope that helps. Oh, that's great. And then, uh, Susan, I mean, just thinking about this, the, the question that was um, about sort of how do we make funding available for both the sort of transactional and, and transformational Work. I mean, so one of the pieces that um, that you and, and Nick Cheeseman wrote for WFD, you know, several years ago now was, was about, I think it was mostly looking at civil society, but it was looking at sort of having a portfolio where you can sort of manage risk and um, where you'd have some bits that are riskier and some bits that, that are that are maybe more conventional. And this seems to align with with Tom's point there that, you know, could we could we not convince donors to sort of allocate a small amount of their funding? <laughs> To, to doing something different and then study it, test it, et cetera, um, you know, rather than saying you have to do everything differently uh, overnight. So Susan, yes, what, what do you um, what do you think about that as a sort of a, a way to way potential way forward? Yeah, I think there's real value in sort of thinking about that kind of portfolio approach because it recognizes that there's there's no one way to do something, right? And if we can't persuade people to, you know, do everything in a more transformative way. You know, perhaps we can persuade them to do some of it. And then it just becomes a question of balance and getting the right mix. But, you know, at least making a start in that direction, you know, adding it, if you will, to the kind of toolbox that, you know, development practitioners have um, is incredibly valuable because another thing that Tom pointed out was that we need positive success stories um, to kind of build this narrative about why these changes are worth, um, you know, undertaking. Um, and one of the things I found in my research is that it's actually remarkably hard to find positive success stories that you can build up a case study on and, you know, do the analysis of, okay, what worked here, you know, what can people learn from it? 
um, it's a lot easier to find examples of kind of catastrophic failures or people critiquing things that went wrong. Um, and so if we can just sort of start to shift things gradually, we can build up, you know, the kind of examples that we have to demonstrate, you know, what does and doesn't work. Um, so that kind of thing, I think, would be incredibly helpful. Right. Well, unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time. Um, so I want to thank uh, my all the panelists here, uh, Tom, Susan, Penindra, and, and Lisbeth in her absence for, for a really great uh, discussion this morning uh, about doing development democratically. I think we've got a, a number of points um, that we can capture and, and hopefully send through uh, to the, the organizers of the summit. Um, obviously, I, I think expectations for what will actually happen at, at this particular summit are, are sort of rapidly declining. But as we move into sort of a, the year of action that's due to follow uh, and, and then into the, the summit for next year, um, you know, these feel like issues that should start to be raised. And, and maybe that year of action is a good point at which we can we can um, sort of catalyze these sort of small bits of change that we might want to see uh, studied over the longer term. Uh, so thank you all again. Thank you uh, for those of you online who've, uh, who've been listening and thank you for your questions. Um, and uh, yeah, so do follow some other events on, on the Global Democracy Coalition uh, website. As I said, WFD's event happening at, at 1 p.m. UK time on women's political leadership also promises to be excellent as well. So uh, thanks everyone and have a good rest of your day. Thank you.